Katie. Uh, the uh, the next speaker is RJ Andrews, who runs a website called Info We Trust, which is a data adventure. It's very cool. Um, in a in a um, in a recent article on Info We Trust, we learned that Cinderella is, in fact, more popular than Snow White or Sleeping Beauty. So that's just something that we should all know. Um, <laughs> RJ uh, is the winner. The site is the winner of the 2014 Kantar Information is Beautiful Gold Award. So it's been uh, very recognized. And uh, you might want to ask RJ about uh, the fact that this weekend he's moving to Kenya. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, so glad he was able to make it out here before that big move. Wow, thank you so much, and uh, I'm so excited to be here, and I'm so excited um, to tell you about some of my heroes. So um, at the surface, I think this is what we do. We show you A, we show you B, but we actually do a lot more than just that because you have A and B, you know that A is big and B is small. So what we actually do is something more like this. At the best of times, we create an experience. Um, we present information in a way that cognitively loads our audience so that they actually do some of the work of processing the story. Uh, we never directly highlight the difference between A and B because we don't have to. We know that everybody who looks at that is going to do that on their own. So it's, it's no accident that this audience engagement and experience happens. Um, I like to think of this as audience interpolation. So our job is to, get an, to create an experience for the audience where we give them nodes and then they connect them. So it's not just show them, don't tell them. It's show them in a way that they tell it to themselves. Because if they are making the connections, then they are engaged. So I want to talk to you a little bit about audience interpolation, not just in data storytelling, but in storytelling across all kinds of media. But first, I think it's really important to remember is that the reason this interpolation is possible is because we have this pattern recognizing workhorse running the show. And it's a workhorse that's better evolved for this environment, sharing stories around the fire, than this one. So there's so much out there there's so much information overload that we need stories now more than ever to pick through all that data, which is why I'm so thankful that we have so many heroes who can guide us. So I have to start with mythology and Joseph Campbell. Um, he showed us how we can connect um, fiction, uh, personal stories, historical anecdotes to a giant cultural monomyth that courses through time and space. Um, last year, I put out this piece of my blog called Creative Routines based on a book by Mason Curry called Daily Rituals. And it may not be obvious why this piece had such uh, crazy success. Uh, printed in a dozen languages, seen by millions. My blog went to 5,000 views per hour, um, which is almost 5,000 views per hour more than I'm used to. <laughs> um, you know, if we take a closer look, yeah, it's topical. We're talking about creativity. We're talking about um, self-improvement, um, but from a data viz perspective, this really isn't the best way to compare Beethoven to Mozart. But people didn't really experience it like this. And going back to Chad, you know, this is about comparing Mozart to you. So the node that I gave you is Mozart's creative routine. But everybody who looked at this had their own routine in their head, and everybody interpolated between Mozart's routine and their own routine. And so I think this piece went viral because of what I call the stars, they're just like us effect. <laughs> so hey, Mozart goes to bed, so do I. <laughs> um, and when you're able to interpolate between your own life and the life of a historic celebrity, it humanizes a celebrity in some way, but it also elevates you. And so right away, again, we're holding the mirror up. So science educators um, are also really, really great storytellers. Um, so recently, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson reminded us about our caveman brains and how they're built for fighting off tigers, not for understanding the complexity of the universe. And so 
uh, you have great Seth, Seth MacFarlane graphics at the recent reboot of Cosmos, and you have science educators using existing mental models to explain the complexity of science. So here we have a 14 billion year history of the universe um, layered over a 24, uh, a 12 month calendar, which is something we sort of all understand. And we can go from the Big Bang all the way to the end of December, where Dr. Tyson stands and represents human life on Earth. And accessing mental models is common throughout uh, science education. Think about David Attenborough um, on the plains of Africa talking about families of animals, right? Always comp um, comparing the complexity of nature and science back to our own human experience. Um, last month, uh, there's a paper published in Science uh, that I contributed to out of MIT. And this paper is all about an algorithm that is going to have a Im big impact on economic policy. And it's, it's fairly complex to understand. Um, and this is sort of the traditional, I, I think, kind of complex way of explaining it. And this is kind of what we kicked the article off with. Um, the point of the algorithm was that we now have a way to make a, what seems to be an unreasonable prediction about a new business and how successful that new business might be, measured in whether or not they'll have a $10 million or more exit or an IPO. And this is really important for studying entrepreneurial policy because we can now study at the time of business registration, uh, what kind of economic policies are actually contributing to uh, quality entrepreneurship um, in a way that before it was very different to call sort of the pizza shops and laundromats away from the technology entrepreneurs. So this is the traditional way of looking at this. And this is you know, sort of how we had to kick the article off. But then we went right to a cartoon. And we explained how the algorithm impacted real businesses on a real block in Palo Alto. And we said, hey, some of these businesses um, have a really good chance of having a growth outcome. And some don't. And here are the, in and here are the uh, influence into those scores. And once you are on board and understand that we're doing this calculation at the business registration level, we can then roll these businesses up into individual cities in California. And so here we have high quality entrepreneurial cities all the way on the right and low, most of the cities all the way on the left, separated out into different regions. And you can see that Silicon Valley at the top has some um, incredible outliers all the way in the top right of the chart. And then finally, once we convince you that we can do this for the cities, we can really start to have some fun because we can start showing you maps. And so here's, um, here's the Silicon Valley region. But then going back to interpolation, you know, we can show you the Bay Area, and we can show you Los Angeles, and we can show you them on their own. But because they're juxtaposed and next to each other, you can understand what a difference there is in entrepreneurial quality between the two regions. So there are, I think we could spend all day talking about lessons from uh, Scott McCloud. But um, a quick one I want to highlight on audience interpolation is that the magic of comic books uh, happens in between the frames, in sort of the, the white space between the frames, because that's where all the creativity um, uh, on your own uh, happens. That's when you know the punch lands from Batman is in between the panes. Um, when you're able to do this with comic books, it makes it a very personal experience. Um, and this is very similar to what Ken Burns talks about when he talks about what makes really great storytelling. He talks about you know real genuine stories is you know uh, greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, you know one of his anecdotes is that. Jefferson tells us all men are created equal. And you might have all kinds of you know, historical and emotional kind of things associated with Thomas Jefferson. But when you juxtapose Jefferson you know, against slavery, you have somebody who's writing that all men are created equal at, at the same time owning over 100 people, uh, someone who never really came to terms like, and acknowledging that contradiction in his own life and the contradiction of the times as a nation you know, born in freedom. Um, was grappling with this issue. So each piece on its own is an amazing story, but if you put them together, it's emotional fireworks. Um, this is similar, I think, to the Broad Street cholera map. So you have you know, one data set, which is here are all the deaths. Another data set is like here are all the water pumps. 
and I'm going to let you figure out you know, what the connection is. Now, of course, this is a great data storytelling example because Jon Snow had studied cholera for 10 years before finally um, able to put this map together. Uh, he didn't use this as data visualization in the sense that he needed to prove to himself the link between bad water and cholera. He used this to show that linkage to public policy uh, and governmental experts to convince them to change the way that they handled public infrastructure in London. And so we still do a lot of great um, data storing in healthcare. Uh, I'm part of, fan of a fantastic team at Duke called the Duke Institute, Institute for Health Innovation. And uh, I just want to kind of build uh, a little story with you in the same way that I did for some of the senior leadership at Duke. So this is a story about a single patient. And what we were able to do with this patient is stitch together over a dozen years worth of data. And this is a patient who ended up having chronic kidney disease. And you don't have to know a lot about kidney disease other than that it's staged based off of your kidney filtration rate. And so if you're up at the top, you're doing fine. And if you're down at the bottom, you know, not so fine. And then the other kind of um, prep is that when you cross this line, you should probably go see a kidney specialist. Um, so the first question is, well, when did this patient actually see a kidney specialist? And we can show you that. And how did they continue seeing a kidney specialist and get dialysis? And then we can keep layering and building a patient graph using, using the decompensation of the disease to sort of give you a trajectory of what this patient's experience was like. But this is sort of a single patient. And unfortunately, this patient's story includes the patient's death uh, late last year. But this isn't the end of this patient's story, because there's still a lot we can learn from this patient. And if you consider this patient's story as the first node, I'd now like to add the second node. And the second node is a second patient. And so here's a second patient with you know, a lot of similar sort of events, ER visits, hospitalizations. But one type of event that's missing from the second patient is a visit to a nephrologist. So this person hasn't seen a kidney specialist at Duke yet. And, you know, hasn't crossed the line yet, but certainly has a trajectory. And even without being a physician, I hope that you're starting to connect one patient's story to the next and saying, hey, how can we learn from that first patient? Can we maybe, instead of using a red line approach, maybe we can start doing prediction. And then maybe if you think about it further, you say, well, wait a second, there's probably a lot of patients out there that we can learn from, and there's a lot more patients out there that we can help. So remember Ken Burns, the sum is greater than the parts. Um, another thing that Ken Burns talks about is that all storytelling is manipulation, sincere, genuine manipulation. And of course, we can do this not for two patients, but we can do this for thousands of patients. And of course, we search through all those thousands of patients to find the exact two that are going to sensationalize and make our point the hardest when we present this story. And just like Jon Snow, this isn't used by the kidney specialist to say this is what care should be. The kidney specialist already knows how to do better care, but he can use this type of visualization to convince others to invest in that type of care. So the last hero I want to bring up is Sally Menke. Menke is a um, Quentin was Quentin Tarantino's um, number one collaborator. She was the editor on uh, like seven or eight Tarantino films, depending on how you count Kill Bill. Um, and there's, there's, um, there's a lot of lessons uh, that we can learn from editing. Um, one, going back to interpolation, is this juxtaposition of, of um, scenes across time, scenes across places uh, for maximum emotional impact. But the other one is that all stories have entropy. And stories are sort of trying to be crap. You have to really be ruthless um, in cutting out the fat and sort of, again, emphasizing what's absolutely essential for maximum emotional impact. Um, the last story I want to tell you is a story about a garden. And uh, David McCandless said that I don't visualize data, I visualize my understanding of the data. And um, in a way, that's sort of what I went for, for 
um, this piece, which is uh, my first animation I, I put out on the blog last week. And so here we have Thomas Jefferson's Garden of Monticello. And what you're seeing is a radial calendar moving around, and there are 212 different flowers in this garden. And you can see them when they pop up, and then when they slowly wither and die. And so there's all kinds of editing decisions that went into making a piece like this. But what I really wanted to do was visualize sort of the ebb and flow, similar to the breathing earth, if you're familiar with that animation, um, of the garden while still maintaining the vibrant beauty of the garden. Um, the coordinator of the garden at the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants saw this, and she remarked that to see the bloom times of these familiar plants visualized in this beautiful manner, I especially like how it shows the spikes of the most floriferous periods here at Monticello, the early flush of bulbs and spring flowery woody plants followed by, and she just keeps going on and on and on. Um, she has a very special mental map of gardening and specifically of this garden. And I think that we sort of all have an opportunity because we're all surrounded by experts um, with special knowledge of how the world works. And it's sort of up to us to find those experts um, or get into the data ourselves and translate and democratize those mental models um, so that we sort of can all benefit from those understandings. And I think that when we do that, then we all become heroes of interpolation. So I'm out of time. That's my talk. Lots of great graphics. Here are all the image credits. Thank you so much.